You know, over the last month or so, I've had uh, people email me wanting to know when I'm going to start research on the next book. And what they don't know is that I've been teaching from some of my basic research for the last five sessions. And uh, what we're doing in understanding the kingdom is actually the prelude to sheer wreath empowerment. And as I'm putting this together, one of the things that I have kind of alluded to in the last four sessions that we, uh, I want this to be time where we can actually step back and kind of think things through. I think there's an anointing right now in this generation to where many of the things that have been taught as standard, uh, now we're not talking about the shed blood of Jesus or salvation through him, but there's been a lot of other things in the word of God that we have jumped to a conclusion. It's like teaching that the Nehesh in Genesis 3 was Lucifer. We don't know that. That's speculation on our part. We can guess that or we, we do know that it was an agent from the kingdom of darkness that did that. But one of the things I have been pondering this week, I want to kind of, if it's okay with you, I want to think out loud just for a couple of minutes as we start this thing. Um, you know, when you read the Genesis account, you read many other of the, you read through the prophets, you read through the, the New Testament. One of the things that I have asked myself the last couple of weeks is when Lucifer fell, was, that, was it at that moment of his fall that all the other angels that were going to fall fell with him? Or was it that there were some of them fell then, and then we begin to see throughout the history of man, we, we, we see, do we see remnants in the word of God where other angels also begin to fall after that original fall? One of the things that, that I have read in most of the systematic theologies that I have went through is that the, the standard reference is that they all fell at the same time. And to be truthful, that is a presumption on our part. We can't actually go to Scripture and say, Thus saith the Lord, all the angels that fell with Lucifer fell with him at this exact moment. In fact, there are hints to Scripture that just maybe this falling away of angels may have been a progressive one that's happened even throughout our own history. Now, <clears throat> some suppose that in, Gen in Revelation chapter 12 where it talks about that there's this war and that Michael, as, as he fights with the dragon or he fights with Lucifer, that one-third of the angels are drawn in its tail and are cast to the earth. And Dake and other evangelical commentators uh, think that that is a parenthetical verses within the book of Revelation, which means it's kind of like a flashback. You ever seen movies where you, you know, you'll have a character and they'll flashback to something in their childhood? <clears throat> but what we're not taught is that not all evangelical theologians believe that. Some of them don't agree with that being uh, parenthetical because everything in the book of Revelation is lined out in a linear fashion. In fact, one of the things as we get later on to this study, and I mean, because we're starting in Genesis, we're going to go all the way through the book of Revelation. I think that Revelation chapter 12, that is not a third heaven war, that is a second heaven war. And that as we get into the tribulation period, we're going to see things like we have never seen before to include all the fallen angels getting cast out of second heaven realities and being restricted to third dimensional realities like you and I. Boy, would that not upset the apple cart like you wouldn't. So we end up seeing everything that has been causing problems on planet Earth become physically real. And yet we have men aligning with them instead of aligning with Jesus that they know is coming. There's a very possibility about that. In fact, there is a hint of the progressive falling away that the Apostle Paul remarks in the church in Corinth. And we find this in 1 Corinthians 11 and 10. Now we're going to find out next week as we get into Genesis 6 that there was a special class of angels. The, the, the Bible simply calls them the B'nai Elohim the sons of God, the book of Enoch calls them the watchers that in time past, they fell because of women. I thought that was kind of interesting. 
that they created giants by, by marrying and interbreeding with women. And yet we, we have the Apostle Paul says something in 1 Corinthians 11.10, dealing with, and remember he's writing to a former pagan society, that, uh, or, or group of people, that many of them came out of the oracles of Delphi. One of the problems that they had was all these temple prostitutes began getting saved. They were well-schooled in esoteric knowledge. And one of the signs of them being a temple prostitute and a follower of, of all that was going on at the oracles of Delphi is they shaved their heads. And so here you have visitors coming to church, if you will, and there's women with shaved heads in a culture that that is a world-famous city for. The first thing that would happen was all these Jews would get upset saying, you're advertising prostitution in the synagogue. You know, cover your head. Paul says, now eventually your hair will grow out. But then he also begins to deal with male headship. And he makes this statement. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. And I believe what Paul was referring to was back to Genesis chapter 6. That the, the, the concept of procreation was something that angels were never meant to have. There, there's only recorded in the word of God male angels, never female. And so there was this temptation that went on. And now the Apostle Paul in the New Testament is stating, remember the angels. Remember what happens if you don't have yourself under godly authority. You become a temptation to angels. And you may say, now, <clears throat> Mike, you are off your rocker. Well, let's look and see what Jude said here in, in Jude. And listen to what he says in, in, in uh, 1 Jude 1, 5 through 7. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that not, did not believe. And the angels which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains unto darkness until the judgment of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, have set forth an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now what's interesting about this strange flesh, <coughs> because whenever you mention Sodom and Gomorrah, we think of homosexuality. To be truthful, every sexual perversion that could be done was done in Sodom and Gomorrah, as well as the Bible tells us forgetting the poor and they corrupted justice. There are stories about Sodom and Gomorrah that if you were starving to, and your family were starving to death, if you would wander into the city, that they would give you money but then not allow any merchant to sell you food so that you starve to death on their streets. And, the, and Sodom and Gomorrah was known for corrupt justice. Does that kind of sound familiar today? But what's interesting is Jude takes a quote from the book of Enoch about the angels, and then he says, now something similar was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. Can I give you kind of a, a, a hint of the other side of the story with, with Lot and the angels that came to visit them? Part of occultic practice, and we see this in the story, uh, stories coming out from like Bill Sneblin and others that were deep into the occult that come out, that you go so far up in the occult, and then you have to marry and have relations with an angel to increase your occult power. That has been a practice that goes all the way back past Sodom and Gomorrah. And one of the reasons that they, 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 the men on the outside knew that these weren't just men, that these were angels, and they had practice occult practices to gain supernatural power. That's why all this is grouped together. The angels had committed fornication, but they had also taught men that by the soul tie with an angel, you increase your occult power. I think that the only class of angels that could, that could cause a procreation were probably the watcher class. The other ones I don't think can. Either that or God has changed the physiology of man with the flood. That the further away you get from the flood, the harder and harder it begins to happen. That's why when the UFOs show up, which I believe are just simply servants of the watchers, that they're always interested in the reproductive processes of, of mankind. 
Why? To try to overcome or, or to circumvent what God did when he changed the physiology of man. A lot changed on planet Earth with the flood of Noah. It wasn't just the drowning of the Nephilim. It was that we, we went from living 1,000 years to 120 years. And the further away you get from the flood, the smaller the giants get. Now, if you think, Mike, <clears throat> nobody on earth would have believed on this and, and what you're saying here. I want to read you a line from uh, Tertullian out of, his, out, out of his treatise on prayers. And it says, the angel revolt Tertullian in an account of the angels, he says, that the women's heads are to be covered because of the angels revolt from God on the account of the daughters of men. So Tertullian, which was about one, um, I think I've got it here somewhere, from 155 to 240 A.D. was the lifespan of Tertullian, which was an apologist in the church. He looks at what the Apostle Paul says here in 1 Corinthians and points back to Genesis chapter 6, just like I did. And what's strategic about Tertullian is the Sethite theory that does away with uh, angels coming and breeding with women was, was done by Julius Africanus, which was in the 5th century. So many of the church fathers all agreed that this was going on. But I thought it was very unique that here we have Tertullian pointing back and coming to the same conclusion out of 1 Corinthians that I just came to. You know, it's always good to know when you have others before you kind of get the same thing. But we need to understand that there, there may have been a progressive falling away throughout human history, and even before human history, of angels falling. But we know by the time we get to Revelation chapter 12 that their total is one-third that Satan draws. And when he is casted out of the second heaven into the first heaven, which is our dimensional reality, that there's one-third of them. And what's interesting is right there it says, and when he comes down like that, he has great wrath. Well, you would too if all of a sudden you're greatly limited in what you can do. I wish I could get Josh Peck here to maybe share a little bit with you guys about what would happen if you were, we, we live on three spatial dimensions. If we were able to, if we were beings created on the fourth spatial dimension, this we get into hypercubes and hyperwheels. But if you're, if you're from the fourth, if you were created to function in that fourth dimension, and I looked at you, I could not only see you, I could see everything in you, spiritually. I could, I could read your mail simply by looking at you. That's why demons can figure out what's going on with you. That's why fallen angels can figure out what's going on with you. If it's not covered in the blood of Jesus, they have full view of what's going on in you. I thought I'd just throw that out. These are some things that we need to understand in the spiritual warfare. That's why repentance is so important in keeping and functioning under the kingdom. The kingdom of God can only function in what the blood of Messiah covers. So I want to go back, back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 5, dealing with the promise of the Nehesh. Now he said, he said, For God doth know that the day that ye eat thereof, even your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now I've already discussed how that mankind, when, when, when humanity fell, the original couple fell, they were infused with the nature of Lucifer. That was the first time that man, in a sense, was born again. He was born from life to death. And he was infused with this new nature, this fallen nature that caused the glory of God to leave, and man realized that he was naked. I mean, this is so important. We've got to understand that that was released into the earth for a purpose. And the mystery of that iniquity is one day it will release into the earth the son of perdition. But it was infused into Adam and Eve. And there are several things that, you know, when we think of, of the Luciferian elite, or we, we think of those in esoteric societies, they, everybody immediately goes to Satanism. Satanism is a subcategory of it. But when you, but when you look at it, there, there are several other things that, that are predominant that, that scale across the whole uh, panacea, if you will, 
of everything from, Luc- from a Luciferian elite to Satanists to a Raza Christian uh, to the Jesuits to, I mean, there's this whole panacea. But what, what they deal with is when we look at the Nehesh, this flaming serpent, this flaming dragon in a tree is the origin of the understanding of illumination. So anytime anyone outside the kingdom of God that is not looking to this for light, the word of God is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Anytime I'm looking into other things, I am looking back to be illuminated by what the Nehesh had promised in the garden. That is the, that is the essence of every esoteric society on the planet is to have unlimited or unfettered access to forbidden knowledge. You see, the Luciferian looks at Genesis chapter 3, and he looks at it this way. There was an evil God. His name was Yahweh. Because he kept man from the knowledge of how to become a God. And there was a good God that came, according to Luciferian doctrine. His name was Lucifer. And he was a good God because he wanted to give man that restricted knowledge. He wanted to give him top secret documents of of, of supernatural revelation that would promise him Godhood. That's where we get the concept apotheosis. Every Freemason, they're, they're striving for apotheosis. That means to ascend into Godhood. If you look on the inside of the U.S. Capitol, there will be this fresco of all these old pagan gods, and right in the center, sitting on the throne of Zeus, is George Washington, and it's called the apotheosis of George Washington, that after he did his craft as a Freemason and founded this nation and all these different things, the day he died, they, they say that he ascended to become a god is what that whole fresco is about that he was able to achieve what the Nehesh had promised mankind. And what they're striving to do is to do it without death and to forever gain this knowledge. Now, even James warns us of this knowledge because this knowledge flows from the Nekesh, and as we're going to see in the weeks to come, it begins to be reintroduced by the watchers, and then it's established in Babylon, and then, then it begins to go out. And so James understands at the time of his writing that we have so many Gentiles coming into the church, coming into the, the Gahal, coming into the Ecclesia, those called out. And he begins warning that there is another wisdom out there. That wisdom goes all the way back to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden and the promise of the Nehesh, of unlimited, restricted access to forbidden knowledge. And listen to what he says here in James chapter 3, verses 13 through 16. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with weakness of wisdom. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. Underline that in your Bible, devilish. In fact, that Greek word devilish means resembling or proceeding from an evil spirit. So literally what the, James is saying is that Nakesh was an evil spirit and th- that's coming from another kingdom and that there is another type of wisdom that is available on planet earth that has now been here since the fall that is now considered earthly. That's what the elite rulers of our nation are tapping into. Washington, D.C. is laid out in in patterns that are occultic, that are esoteric, to align themselves up with second heaven realities that they can begin pulling occult power and knowledge out of the second heaven from these beings to, to, to achieve apotheosis and to pull men away from God is what he's talking about. The UN is the same thing. I have never, well, you know what's scary to me is that we have all these people in the UN can't even get their own nation straight, and they're trying to straighten out ours. 
the same nation with the same group of people with all of the atrocities on planet Earth going on, they say the number one violator of women's rights is Israel. Uh, makes you kind of wonder what they're smoking. And they're supposed to achieve peace on earth. You can't do what only Jesus can do. And Jesus is getting ready to come back very soon. I think in the next 30 years, Messiah is coming back. And when he does, how many know there is going to be no United Nations? In fact, you can take the United Nations symbol with a laurel wreath and the, the wheel you take away, this the, the, the continents, and that wheel is the occult wheel of reincarnation. It's an occultic symbol saying that they are going to rule the world through their occult power and the occult cycles that the Nehesh taught them that was embedded into Nimrod and began seeded into all the earth. That thing's not going to exist. What's going to exist is a throne in Jerusalem and Messiah is going to sit on it. And he's going to have to reteach the world the wisdom that can only come from God. His Torah shall flow like a river from Zion. So the concept of illumination of restricted knowledge and the promise of apotheosis is embedded into every mystery religion and every branch of the occult. And one of the things I have come to believe too, occult does not only mean that what they hide is, what they do is hidden. They try to hide it in plain sight. But I believe that they're, abs they're constantly striving to find that which is hidden. The hidden knowledge promised by the Nechesh in the garden. And we come to the realization that absolutely every civilization on this planet is in part or in whole based upon what the Nehesh had taught, what the Watchers had taught, and other fallen spirits had taught. No wonder Psalms chapter true is to why the kings, they try to, trying to cast off God's word and God's restrictions. And God's going to laugh at them. How many know it's always good to be on the winning side? Let's go on back here in Genesis chapter 3, verses 21 through 24. Now, one of the things I see in, the first, in, in Genesis 1 through 3 is that the first, second, sec, second heaven, and third heaven, Adam had access to all of them. God would come, and th that was simply the part of the garden that God would come into. But Adam could see God. God, you know, he could see. That it, it wasn't that it was all separated like it is now. But there's evidence in the scripture where God separates it at the fall of men, and he does it because of grace. Let's get into it. Starting in verse 20. And unto Adam and his wife, the Lord God, did make uh, coats of skin and clothed them, and the Lord... God said, Behold, man has become as one of us, knowing good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove, man out, he drove out the man, and he placed at the eastward garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Several things we've, we've got to look at here. Number one, I think there was more than just coats being made to cover their nakedness. Jameson Fawcett Brown in verse, in, regarding verse 12 says this, God made coats of skin, taught them to make these for themselves. This implies the institution of animal sacrifice, which was undoubtedly the divine appointment and instruction in the only acceptable mode of worship for sinful creatures through faith in a redeemer. That's why when there's the conflict between Cain and Abel, Cain knew what was acceptable because his parents had already been taught by God. It was at this moment. And, by, and God always loves to use physical things to teach us spiritual realities. We look at the prayer shawl with the tzitzit on them. It teaches us the commandments of God. That blue cord wrapped through, which means the only way that you're ever going to get it done is through the completed work of Messiah. 
And so they're, they're, all throughout the, the, the divine rehearsals are all physical things or things that we can do to teach us spiritual realities. And so the very first lesson that God taught man is just as you need clothing to cover your nakedness, in the bringing forth of that clothing, blood had to be shed because there's something greater that needs to be covered. Your spiritual nakedness, your spiritual sin can only be covered by blood. And therefore, even this first session here is a type and shadow of what Messiah was going to do for us at the cross. That Almighty God had to come down himself and shed eternal blood. Now, God forces Adam and Eve from the garden, but why does he do this? He says this, you know good and evil now. You've been, now been infected with evil. You've been infected with this, with this infection that even infected part of heaven itself, this iniquity that was birthed into Lucifer. And now if you would stretch forth your hand and eat of the tree of life, you would forever be locked into that situation there would not only would you live forever it's not just mortality it's mortality in this sinful state therefore for your sake i'm going to drive you out of the garden because i can't let you have that because i have a plan to redeem you back i'm going to fix this i promise to fix it and the have we ever, have any of us ever had God to really do what he needed to do in our lives? He had to keep us from something. Come on. That's just a repeat of what happened in the garden. God loved Adam and Eve enough. God loved you and I enough that he had to, he had to drive them out of the garden and he set cherubim and a flaming sword so that they could not get back. Now, the commentary on the Old Testament says this, the expulsion from paradise, therefore, was a punishment inflicted for man's good. Indeed, while exposing him to temporal death to preserve him from eternal death. Now, what's really interesting here is, especially when you read it in the Hebrew or the English, you're the one, you have the cherubim, and cherubim, when you look at them throughout the Word of God, their basic function is to guard. So here they are guarding this, 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 where the tree of life is. They're guarding it. But the, the word does not say that these cherubim had swords of fire. It said there were cherubim and there was this sword hung out in the middle of nothing. And no matter which way you go, it would keep you from getting in the garden. It was a multi dimensional severing by a flaming sword that separated the first, second, and third heaven. Now, this does not originate with me. I was listening to Dr. Chuck Messler. In fact, I, I, I uh, talked with Josh Peck last night just to make sure. I said, I think I got this from Chuck Messler. And he says, I think I did too. And, I, and both of us have kind of come to the conclusion it was his, his video on the holographic universe. But God uses the sword to separate out the first, second, and third heaven. And there are cherubim there that keep man out. In fact, we know, and uh, Rob Skiba did a, an awesome uh, teaching uh, that, that he did where he basically, where Mount Gerizim and Mount Nebo may have been the mounts right there of the garden. And one mount is for cursing, one is for blessing. One had the tree of life, one had the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, maybe the exact same area, which is very interesting because that's the first area in between there. I think it's Shechem, if I'm remembering correctly, is the first, where the first sacrifice was made. When Israel comes out of Egypt and they come back there, God stops them between the two. And he says, I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. And they did a sacrifice before they went on into the land. So we know physically where the first dimensional reality of the Garden of Eden is, but there's no trees there because that has been separated out and now reserved in the third heaven. Now when Jesus comes back, he brings the kingdom with him because the, the only place in the universe that the kingdom of God has no rival is the third heaven. 
and he's bringing the kingdom back with him. That means through Christ, when I learn to function in my kingdom realities, I can tap into third heaven power and authority, which supersedes the second heaven. Now, the second heaven is a hash mash, if you will, of godly angels and evil angels fighting to keep God out of here. That's where principalities and powers and rulers of darkness, they're all operating in this second heaven. But you can't really see that. In fact, I believe when people astral project, there's probably a small barrier between the first heaven and the second heaven. They don't go up into the second heaven and do battle. God never tells you to go up into the second heaven to do battle. You pray and let him send angels and let them do that. Our authority and our purpose is in the first heaven, this dimensional reality we call physical earth. We're to do warfare here. And your greatest warfare is not about what you just pray. It's about what you do. It's what Adam did that brought in the enemy. And it could have been what Adam did to have kept him out. We have got to learn from this situation to understand when I'm doing things, I'm either releasing one kingdom or another into my life. That's why the body of Christ needs to rediscover the commandments of God. Otherwise, what you're doing with a religious veneer is you're following the teachings of the Nechesh and the Watchers and the Principalities and the Kingdom of Darkness, and you put this veneer on it and call it Greasy Grace, and all the time, you're simple, everything that you're doing violates the ways that God has put in black and white. And we're constantly tearing down our walls of protection. We're constantly doing their ways. And we're tapping into wisdom that is filled with darkness. And then we're constantly going to the altar and crying, God, oh God, why is all this happening to me? It's because everything you're doing is their stuff. And when you do their stuff, you're releasing their power into your life. And what God is saying, listen, what I'm trying to get across to you is there's another kingdom. And when you do that kingdom's stuff, you release that kingdom's power and purpose into your life. And what I'm finding out in my old age, guys, I wish somebody would have taught this to me when I was in my 20s. That's one of the reasons why I'm trying to teach all this stuff. My goodness, how much life could have been a whole lot better. Because now that I'm in Christ, how about me start acting like him? Jesus was, was the commandments not only in motion, they were poetry in motion, the way that he lived them. And if I'm going to be like him, I've got to keep the commandments the same way that Jesus did. Isn't that what, first John, what John said in 1 John? If I say that I'm in him, maybe I should walk like him and keep the commandments the same way that he did. He was the perfect Jew. He was the perfect Hebrew. He was the Torah in motion. That's why whenever he came into a situation, the kingdom of darkness had to bow and the kingdom of God flowed because he only did what the Father told him to do. The only time he ever felt the other side and there was such a struggle that he sweat blood that it began to break the capillaries in his face is when in the Garden of Gethsemane, he began to feel our desires instead of his. And he was able to push them down and obey anyway. That's why in Hebrews it says, you've not struggled unto death with that kind of struggle. He did to give you the power to walk in that kind of an anointing. That's what all this is about. That's why we need to understand that the, what, the, what is happening in America, what's happening around the world, there is an anointing, there is a power, there is a wisdom, there is an intelligence beyond our comprehension behind it, but we need to realize I have access to an intelligence greater than that intelligence. I have, an, I have access to an anointing greater than that anointing. I have access to wisdom greater than that wisdom. If I'll simply yield to God and get back and be a man or a woman of this book, start it in Genesis and let it go all the way back to the book of Revelation. It is time, <clears throat> I, I'm seeing on Facebook where I'm, I'm looking at guns and those like with Canary Cry and Rob Skeeb and all those. One of the things they're doing 
is they're questioning everything. Now, they don't question the blood of Jesus, salvation through the blood, but they begin questioning everything, which is good. The Apostle Paul says, prove all things. And they're, they're, they're questioning the status quo of a lot of things that tend to be more the traditions of men, maybe, than it is really the word of God. And by questioning them and examining it from all angles properly, you begin to find out what's real and what's of the other kingdom or what's just a bunch of hokum. And some people don't like that because if you question somebody else's theological position, I mean, they come out with clubs and, and pitchforks and tar and feather. You know, and I'm, I'm grateful whenever I do radio shows and they don't allow questions on, you know, when people call into the radio show. I'm grateful for that because nobody's interested in what I wrote. I found this out. They're interested in my take on their position. So you want to know my take on your position, which may or may not be error, and some of this stuff, guys, I have never heard of. What do you think about the polar shift on Venus and Mars? I don't care. I'm not on it. <laughs> there may have been a whole lot of shaking going on, but there wasn't anybody there to notice it. You know what I mean? I don't care. I care about this. Let's get back into the word, and there, we need to understand that one of the reasons God's allowing us to do this, there needs to be some traditions of men and some presumptions or assumptions that we have made, maybe, and made it theological doctrine that if you really examine it with the light of what we know now, you know, it, it's, it's like for the first time, this, this last week, for the first time in, since I was 13, I've been in ministry, so it's been almost 40 years. For the first time, I've had somebody question the Godhood of Jesus because they don't understand. Now, when you begin understanding physics and that there are 10-dimensional realities, Understanding a God that one God, one God that manifests himself as three witnesses in the earth becomes very easy. All you got to do is go back to basic physics and flatland to understand it. Because in physics and flatland, if, you don't, if we're only two dimensional, I could take my hand, put three fingers in it, look like three entities, and they can only perceive the curves. And it would be like magic. It disappears here. It comes back here. It disappears here. It moves through objects here because it's... And God not only is able to operate on three dimensions, four dimensions, he is able to operate on ten dimensions. And if there's any more above that, God fills and operates on all of it. And how do you get a mindset based upon a three-dimensional reality? How do, in the world do you understand a God that operates on ten dimensions that even the angels that operate in the second and third heaven look at him and say, I've never seen anything like him. Jesus is not a different God than Yahweh. The Holy Spirit is not a different God than Yahweh or the Ancient of Days in the book. The Godhead is simply the manifestation of one God in this three-dimensional reality. That's why Jesus is encoded in Yahweh. But yet, because we're going to be able to easily know him, he's separated in the first line of Genesis. He is the olive top sitting right next to Elohim. And Elohim is unique in all the word of God. It is a plural word that has a singular meaning. Because God decided, no one can testify of me save myself. And so he has come as three witnesses in the earth of who he is. Jesus is almighty God come in the flesh. The only reason that, from my point of view, as far as I can understand it, we call him the son of God is because God came down and made a body that was birthed of a woman that he could fill. That made Messiah unique. And theologians are still, we've been arguing and trying to figure this thing out for 2,000 years. Maybe physics is going to help us out a little bit. Our minds need to stretch. Solomon, looking at the first temple, said that the entire universe is not big enough to contain the presence of God. 
And if he's so big, maybe it took three representations of him for us to begin to even have an inkling of who he is. That's how big our God is. People are getting freaked out about angels. You know what? I serve the one who created them. And the angels look at him, and they get freaked out. That's the one I serve. The one I serve makes the Nachesh in Genesis 3 look like an idiot. I've said this before, but when we get to a certain place in the book of Revelation, Lucifer says, okay, I've been playing checkers all these years, king me. And God's been playing 10-dimensional chess, and he says, checkmate. Lu we're, we're, now, we're no match for Lucifer, but Lucifer is no match for Yahweh Elohim. No match. It's the arrogance that was birthed in him when, he, when iniquity was created in him to make him think that he could ever overcome God. That's the God that we have to serve. So why, why am I sharing all this? Because, guys, we need to understand that we have access to something greater than what the Nekesh offered. We have access to third heaven realities. The Nekesh promised knowledge from the second heaven. In Hebrews 4.16, it says, Let us come boldly unto the throne of grace that we might receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. That through Christ, that by his shed blood, by, by who he is, and when I'm in him, I have access to the mercy seat of God, that throne of grace in heaven of mercy. When I need it, all I've got to do is stop and pray, and my spirit man connects through the second heaven immediately into the third heaven before the throne of God that I can come boldly or without reservation into his presence being found in Christ to overcome everything the Nechesh is doing in the earth. So as we begin to unfold these things, I don't want us to be overcome by them. You need to understand the enemy, but then you also have to realize the new arsenal of weapons and abilities that you have in Christ. It's so important. And so, Father, I ask if you do anything this morning that, number one, you'd make us aware of the devices of the enemy, but, Father, that you would burn into our consciousness who we are and what we've become, this new creation in Christ Jesus. Father, let us only be found in Jesus. Let us only be found under the shed blood of Messiah. Let us only be found with his knowledge, his wisdom, and his purpose working in us. And Father, let us reject the darkness that is filling this earth so that we may be a light shining in darkness to bring glory and honor and reverence to the name of Jesus in all the earth. Father, we thank you today. We give you glory for it in Jesus' name.